Hey everyone, me Kevin here, coming to you from a lake in Canada, and I'll tell you, it is awesome to just sit in the middle of a lake and think. And of course, what do I think about? Nothing other than the Federal Reserve. See, the Federal Reserve has a very big week coming up. A lot of the bears are telling us that this is going to be the week that we finally get rug pulled, and a lot of the bulls are saying this is the week that we finally go to the moon. So which is it? And what expectations should we have going into this week? Especially since I'm going to go through numbers in terms of not only the Federal Reserve, but listen to these data sets we've got coming out. CPI this week, PPI this week, and retail sales all this week, along with the Fed potential hike and the ECB potential hike. That's a lot coming out this week. So uh, let's discuss. The first thing that we have to keep in mind is that the Federal Reserve has to, this week, really telegraph to the entire world, what strategy are we undertaking? No matter whether you are a bull or a bear, this week will be that moment where the Federal Reserve finally has to decide what is more important to us. Maintaining the economy in such a way that we don't have mass unemployment and we fight inflation with everything that we have, or do we fight patiently? That is, we patiently allow disinflation to occur. We patiently allow the markets to resume their activity. And we essentially slowly Nike swoosh recovery back to where we were and potentially beyond. That's the question. And the reason this week is so pivotal for that is because obviously it is widely expected that the Federal Reserve is going to pause. In pausing, the Federal Reserve will likely give us a hawkish pause. That is, they'll talk to us dirty. They'll talk to us about how they're going to, in the future, be open to hiking again. But not only are they going to do that, they're going to give us a summary of economic projections in SCP. And they're going to use that. Yeah, Jack. Um, that, there's a, I don't know what it's called, but it's a person again. Yeah, there's there's somebody, uh, what are they called? Uh, like a... Um, uh, what? Yeah, water what are they called? Skiing? Water skiing. Yeah, there are water skis over there. People are having fun out here. All right, Jack, I got to keep talking about fun things like the summary of economic projections, okay? Yeah. You want to say hi really quick? Yes. <laughs> All right. So back to the summary of economic projections. This will be another tool for the Federal Reserve to telegraph how seriously they want to take inflation. And there are two ways to really go here. You can go in the direction that the bears expect, which is, okay, the stock market is going up. Real estate is starting to go up. Uh, again, since January, it's been trending up. We still haven't seen that surge of inventory. It is what it is. Markets, we just have to observe what markets are doing and, and play the best we can, right? So markets recovering. And the Fed might look at that and say, wait a minute. In 2022, we were actually hoping markets would go down. Specifically, the real estate market, because that, via the wealth effect, contributes to people feeling less rich and therefore spending less money. That puts less pressure on supply chains, which puts less pressure on prices, right? Jack, would you mind sitting down? You're distracting me, dancing around like that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that puts less pressure on inflation. So the idea was, okay, let's ruin people's wealth, basically. Wait for a reset, so to speak, as Jerome Powell suggested, and uh, then inflation will go away because there'll be less availability of capital for people to make investments, to hire people, uh, to buy goods and services, and that'll reduce inflation. Uh, Mr. Schiller, Robert Schiller, uh, famous for the Case Schiller Index for real estate home prices, he's a famous economist, he suggests that real estate home values have more of an impact on the wealth effect, that is people's propensity to spend money, than the stock market. But personally, I, as an anecdote, I somewhat disagree with that. Somebody who's more heavily exposed to stocks, I personally believe will feel a little bit more like, yeah, we could go on that vacation if stocks are up versus when stocks are going down and you're like, I don't know, man, am I gonna hit a margin call? Like, logically, it seems to me that both of those wealth effects would matter, but who knows? So. A lot of the bears right now, and I've been, I've been reading a lot of what the bears have been saying, so that way I can have a really good understanding of what's going on, uh, at least what the bear argument is. The bears are reiterating that, look, you can't have the stock market going into a bull run territory when the Fed's in a tightening cycle. You need to crush the stock market rally, and therefore, this is the week that stocks are finally going to get their reality check. So load up the shorts. And quite frankly, loading up the shorts could have contributed to the rally that we've seen over the last two weeks. I know that sounds crazy, but think about this for a moment. When people are buying 
short position put options for the 16th. I think I previously said the 17th. It's the 16th. It's the Friday. Then, uh, thanks to Delta hedging and basically the way my, uh, these these um, uh, market makers work is they start buying the counter position a couple weeks early. <laughs> and so you have this really weird phenomenon where potentially in front of a lot of shorting, you get this run-up of stocks, which we've kind of seen. So that's somewhat consistent with this leveling up of shorts or hedges going into this particular week here. So you've got the Fed set up for telling us what's more important, slowly fighting inflation or quickly fighting inflation. You have the opposite of the wealth effect coming right now. No matter what you believe about the wealth effect, the reality is things are up right now. So if the Fed cares about the wealth effect, they got to drive markets down this week. If, uh, if and, and that'll prove short sellers correct. However, that thesis is based on the Federal Reserve needing to cause more unemployment. And see, this is the interesting part about the Fed. What if we get a Fed, which we may, that says, hey, we don't, actually need to destroy the economy. We have enough disinflationary pressures that if we just stay on the course we are now, in other words, stay at 5%, and inflation, the next inflation reports continue to come in as they are currently, we expect we will return to 2% inflation by, say, the first quarter of 2026, which their summary of economic projections may show. Well, in that case, the Federal Reserve doesn't actually potentially have to hike again. They just need to stay at this level for higher for longer, right? Five being the higher level and then for longer. Now, the problem with that is it also assumes uh, that the best thing to do is just stay in stocks. But wait a minute. Markets, at least 60% of Bloomberg economists, are still projecting a recession this year. That's because if you look at the bond market, it's still insanely inverted. But that actually suggests that the Fed has maybe gone too far, that they've already over-tightened, that inflation isn't actually the boogeyman. The real boogeyman is the earnings recession and that we're really going into a harsh recession. And because we're going into a harsh recession, and then that's when the job loss will truly come when that earnings recession occurs. That's when we'll see the mass unemployment at the same time as stocks potentially hit new lows. That's sort of the argument. Well, then the Federal Reserve actually has to balance that as well. And ironically, that's a scenario that would suggest Fed rate cuts. So really what I've just set up are three scenarios that we're trying to evaluate. And that's what makes this so blurry. You're trying to evaluate, hey, 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 is inflation sticky? You need to hike more. The second scenario is, no, 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 we're, we're good. Inflation expectations are anchored. Just be patient and let this slowly roll off, just like we've done historically. Opportunistic disinflation, slowly roll inflation off. And the third scenario is, you've already gone too far. We're going into recession. We're screwed. In scenario number one, where they hike rates even more and more and more, and we go to a 6% terminal or whatever, you don't want to be, you know, you're going to have some downside to stocks. In scenario number three, where we go into recession, you potentially have some downside to stocks. But then again, you look at Germany, <laughs> you know, they're in a recession and their stock market is at all-time highs. And then you have this middle ground, which is often associated with a soft landing, which is maybe no recession. And wow, inflation just slowly trends away very slowly. It's everyone's guess, obviously, as to what's going to happen. The bond market says the third scenario is going to happen. The bears say the first scenario is going to happen. That is, we need to raise rates more to make sure we get rid of inflation, but then we're going to cause that dirty recession. So you'll end up with the third scenario anyway. And then the bulls are in the middle going, oh, I think actually everything's going to be okay. And I think this is where it's worth me imparting my opinion. So I wanted to catch you up with fact. Uh, and then we're going to go through data as well. We've got some data to go through as well. Uh, see, like, <laughs> here's one of the hawks going. Uh, this next Fed meeting is going to usher in the next phase of the central bank hiking cycle. And they use the Bank of Canada to suggest that that's it. Here it comes. Here comes the next hiking cycle. They've, they've gone from pausing in January to starting to hike again in June. Uh, we're going to have a shallower monetary easing path beyond 2023. That's going to be something the markets have to price in. And all it's going to take is a, a hot CPI report here to knock the Fed off their rockers. And let's go through some inflationary projections as well here. But let's first give you my opinion. And then I want to hit data. Okay, so so far I've caught you up with the Fed. Now we're going to go into my opinion. Uh, also, I'd like to announce uh, that we're going to be uh, slowly, 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 
remaking a lot of the lectures in uh, the Stocks and Psychology of Money course and the Real Estate Investing course. Uh, that's going to be completely for free for existing members. And uh, once that process is complete, we'll have another quite large price increase because the, quant the, the I think the quality is going to go from amazing already to amazing times two. Uh, so feel free to use the coupon code down below. Uh, we're calling it AI more this time because we're going to be incorporating AI to every lecture as we go through and remake the courses, uh, which will be really incredible. So really remaking everything thanks to AI now, which I'm very excited about. So stay tuned for that, but use that coupon code down below. So uh, what is my opinion? Uh, and Jack, I've got maybe about three or four more minutes. All right. So my opinion is that we are right now looking at a wage disinflationary process happening. If you look at wage growth, it's basically a chart that peaked in January of about 2022, and CPI peaked about six months later. Okay, what's interesting about that is the rate of wage disinflation has fallen the most in the last month compared to the last six months therefore, thereafter, or there before. So in other words, we've started seeing wage disinflation really come down, and in this last month, it's come down even more. In other words, the next six months, we're going to slowly start seeing that wage disinflation priced into CPI. Well, where do wages generally show up in CPI? They show up in services. Services is the last argument the bears have, that services inflation is sticky. And because services inflation is sticky, we are going to have to hike more. But I think the Federal Reserve will take a path of patience and say, you know what, let's let's give it, let's wait for the data to see will that wage disinflation translate into services disinflation. If it does, we could stay here and eventually talk about cutting. If it doesn't, if for some reason services inflation takes off again, well, then obviously we have a problem and we're going to have to hike more and we're going to keep that optionality open. So if I were the Federal Reserve right now, I would be very transparent and say, look, at this point, with the data we have and inflation expectations where they are, we think inflation will roll down to 2% by the beginning of 2026, and we are okay waiting that long. However, we realize markets are up, housing prices have started to rebound again, and because of this, there is a risk that people spend more money. And if supply chains are not available to absorb that additional demand, because remember that as well. A lot of people are like, well, when people go back to spending, then inflation will happen. No, because supply chains could have potentially been prepared for a new surge of spending again. This is why I actually don't think you're going to see a chip shortage again, because you had supply chains build up massively. And even though now everybody wants chips for AI, we're ready and available to manufacture more. Although there's a limit to that, okay? Because even Elon Musk is complaining that he's starting to see some chip shortages again. So there's a limit, obviously, to everything. But the point is that in most areas, we've really built up these supply chains again. So anyway, um, so the Fed should be very transparent and saying, look, if supply chains are available to handle the extra demand, and as a result, we don't actually see a, a pricing pressure, then we are okay patiently waiting until the beginning of 2026 for inflation to return to 2%. Uh, and in such a case, as long as we don't get hot CPI, PPI data between now and then, we don't necessarily need to keep hiking. We are at sufficiently restrictive levels, and we will stay here until we are convinced that we are not going to unanchor inflation expectations, which they are anchored very low right now, and we are not going to return to any kind of larger inflation uh, it reports. That's what I would say if I were the Fed. But then again, the Fed can't necessarily say that because there is a risk of the Fed saying that, leading to people going, all right, take out every loan we can get. Oh, there's a B. Take out every loan we can get and, uh, and, and spend money. Uh, and, and then that actually ends up creating too much of a spending, oh, it's right behind me. I mean, I don't really mind if it's just sitting next to me. It's not coming after me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that is going to create uh, uh, this potential risk of people coming out and borrowing money and spending money like crazy again. So that is a big risk. Uh, so um, the Fed's going to have to figure out how to massage that message. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of reading between the lines to determine, okay, is the Federal Reserve uh, uh, going, to, uh, going to be as transparent as this? Probably not. Because that level of transparency risks uh, basically inducing too much buying and too much recklessness. Although we're already starting to see FOMO trades come back like crazy, right? With the exception of old coins and crypto, but that's really a topic for a different video. And that has a lot to do with regulation, not so much uh, the Fed. So let's get to the data and wrap this video up. So here's the data. First of all, uh, we have uh, some researchers 
uh, Credit Agricole. Credit Agricole believes that they think headline CPA is only going to rise by 0.1% month over month, slowing from the 0.4% we got last month. Uh, and then year over year, we're going to see CPI go down to 4%, down from the 4.9% last month. Uh, now, what we'll also expect... Jack, what's going on? I'm just listening. Okay. Because, you, like, kicking your leg makes me think you have to, like, go to the bathroom or something really badly. Oh. <laughs> Can you just sit down and chill? <laughs> All right. So, uh, re regarding um, month over month core, they expect core to rise 0.35%. And the year over year slowing to 5.2. Uh, now, they also believe that this is going to lead to a gradual core slowdown to 3.5. This is Credit Agricole's expectation. This gradual slowdown of core is going to really trigger the Fed's patience. Is the Fed willing to be patient? And that's what we're hoping to get as a signal this week. Hopefully is the answer. But anyway... When we look at uh, the Bloomberg Economist projections for CPI, CPI survey for month over month is actually 0.2 as opposed to Credit Agricole's 0.1. And then core, they're looking for 0.4, uh, which actually, if we look into the detail, is actually 0.37. So we'll see when we actually get the numbers, but probably a 0 0.2, 0 0.4, anything less than that would be good news for the stock market and the Fed. Because really, if we get a bad CPI release here, the Fed will give us a 25 basis point hike. The markets will price it in right away. They'll send a text message to Nick T going, we have to switch to hiking. He'll publish a Wall Street Journal article. And then every mainstream news organization will publish an article going, Fed might have to transition to hikes. And then they'll, they'll hike again. But it would really require a, a miss that none of the leading indicators are really suggesting we're going to get. So I wouldn't be betting on a miss. But then again, mo if most people don't bet on a miss, maybe the most profitable bet is betting on a miss, right? That's the irony. Like, if everybody knows the stock is going to fall, everybody shorts it, and then nobody makes money shorting it. It's the, this crazy irony, especially when you're playing options. Anyway, uh, okay, so then we have PPI the very next day. We actually think PPI headline month over month will go negative 0.1. PPI core will be 0.2. Uh, 0.2 is actually fantastic because that brings you to about a 2.4% year over year uh, when you annualize it. Uh, then, of course, we have the rate expectations we're expecting to hold. Uh, but then we also, uh, so let me be clear here, on CPI, we're going to get CPI Tuesday. Tuesday the 13th at 5.30 a.m. I will be live streaming, even though I'm in Canada. So stay tuned for that. Uh, then we are going to get CPI or PPI Wednesday at 5.30 a.m. I will be live streaming that, even though I am in Canada. Uh, then we will be covering the FOMC meeting on Wednesday at 11 a.m. California time. I will be live streaming that, even though I'm in Canada. Retail sales Thursday morning at 5.30 a.m. I'll be live streaming that. We're expecting a month over month advance of negative 0.1%. Uh, that's going to be after the Fed's meeting. So we're really not terribly expecting that to really affect uh, uh, the Federal Reserve's decision making because the only central bank making a decision that day is actually the ECB. And they're actually expected to hike by 25 basis points. So we'll see. So most economists right now expecting this to be a hawkish pause. Uh, and then we're looking for data on what's going to happen with these next... Uh, with these three scenarios, these three scenarios playing out. I would argue that if we're going to go into a recession, it's probably going to be relatively shallow. And in a recession, in that lower scenario, you would expect Fed rate cuts. And honestly, even though you'll have volatility in stocks and you have some kind of earnings recession, much like uh, what I've been calling for in the staple sector, you know, the targets, the Costco, whatever. I really think the, the Lowe's, the Home Depot's, I think these guys are going to get hit a lot more than, than the tech. That's why I've been positioned in tech and growth, uh, certainly since November of 2022, basically been all in. But I did get, get in pretty early before that as well, uh, which, you know, still led me to ride down a little bit. But oh well, it can't be perfect with the timing. But anyway, uh, I, I still believe in, in, in tech and chips. Uh, some of them are getting a little frothy though, so we have to be a little careful. I think probably the weakest sector right now and the most undesirable sector is actually retail. It's going to be like your your uh, non-staples retail, more of your discretionary retail. So like uh, your, your Etsy, right? Uh, just as an example. So I'm, I'm watching that, maybe like even your Dave & Buster's, although that's done well after earnings. So I'm watching those. I haven't made any moves on those yet. So uh, then after that, and of course, when I do, I'll send an alert to everybody in the stocks and site group. Uh, then uh, after that, as far as the, the middle case scenario, I want to be in stocks. So recessionary scenario, I want to be in stocks. Middle case scenario, I want to be in stocks. And oh, fighter jets right there, Jack. Uh, and then in the uppercase scenario, which is the Fed hiking more, 
Honestly, I'm not terribly. Let me see if you guys can see the Jets. Jack, can you point at them? Point at the Jets. Right over there, they're pretty tiny, so maybe you can't see them. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we can see them unless they come back over this way. <laughs> I don't know if they will. Um, anyway, uh, so the top scenario, which is, okay, well, the Fed might have to hike more. Honestly, I don't really care because. In my opinion, the Federal Reserve, oh, they might be turning this way. In my opinion, the markets were pricing in Paul Volcker last year. And in pricing in Paul, they are coming this way. They're putting on a show for us. What a treat. They're trying to remind you. Oh my gosh, they're going to come right over us. Look at that. Where are they? There they are. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, wow, Jack. We got to fly by. <laughs> Dude. That was so cool. <laughs> They're like, hey, it's me, Kevin, making a video trying to pitch his coupon code. Let's silence him. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, okay. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> so, uh, last scenario is, is Fed hiking board. I don't care. That's why I want to be in stocks. Because even if they hike more, I don't think we're pricing in a Paul Volcker. So, quite frankly, even if rates go up to 6%, I don't think we get back to new lows, to Paul Volcker levels. Uh, so basically in every scenario, I, I lean bullish. Am I suggesting things are going to go straight up and it's all in an NVIDIA or, or meme stocks right now? No, of course not. You know, so, so I think there's a, a cautious optimism that I have. Uh, I don't think that's associated with perma bullish because, you know, obviously at the beginning of last year, we were extremely bearish, but going into this year, we've been extremely bullish uh, in fairness because it was the right move. <laughs> I mean, I remember November, December, January, March, people were like, Kevin, we should be going all in on crypto. I'm like, why? These stocks have such great fundamentals. They're so cheap right now. Now, a lot of things I will say have become uncheap again, right? Tesla's pegs back over two. And I'm like, dang it. You know, Enphase is still somewhat cheap. Uh, and, and the housing market is actually trending up, which should be good for sales again. But it's expensive to borrow for solar panels right now. So TBD. But anyway, I'm looking for more deals. Uh, I suppose I would I would pay attention to. I'm not convinced 100% yet, but I'd be looking at things like uh, Enphase, Etsy, uh, and, um, you know, honestly, I'm looking for more suggestions. So if you can give me some more suggestions, like, oh, Ubiquity. Ubiquity's dirt cheap right now. Uh, that's another one. That's ticker symbol UI. So anyway, uh, check out those. I do own all three of those. So I want to be transparent about that. I have exposure to all three of those. Uh, so I, it's not that I'm just trying to pump my book. It's, it's that, quite frankly, I... I, I'm looking for where the other deals are, and I'm like, dang, things that were cheap aren't cheap anymore. So anyway, hopefully that's insightful to you. Uh, let me know what you think. Leave a comment down below, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Remember, we are doing a complete course refresh. Jack, you're welcome to turn the engine on. Uh, we're doing a complete course refresh uh, for Stocks and Psych and Zero to Millionaire Real Estate Investing. Oh, Jack, you have to put it in neutral. Pull the stick all the way to neutral. There you go. Okay, now you should be able to turn it on. And um, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.